And this has happened so many times, and it's always annoyed me. But on this particular day, <laughs> I spun around and I kicked I kicked my carry on as hard as I could. <laughs> Get back to Joan Rivers. Si- yeah, si- yeah, since you invoked yeah. her name. She wasn't that person that you saw that big. Everybody loved her. Fashion Police was young people. UVC was middle-aged, and the Carson crowd was older, and she bridged all of that. She was fearless. She was funny. She made my bosses extraordinarily uncomfortable. And you got cameramen doing full planks in yeah, mid air, yeah. hitting the ground like a, I mean, right. it was shocking. Peter Tilden, awfully nice of you to come by. Appreciate I, it. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. Now, are you overstating it? I mean, where does thrilled actually live on the <laughs> all right, hierarchy all right, you know of emotion? You already called me. <laughs> I just, I mean. You already called me. Actually, you know what? I am thrilled. I am thrilled because I'm a fan of yours. I've watched you do stuff for years. <laughs> Some of it you didn't even know, you didn't want me to watch, but I watched it anyway. Um, so it's, yeah, I'm a little flattered. Well, well you know what? Flattered. Okay, well, let me take a little air out of that tire for you. Because the <laughs> idea was, Chuck comes in and he's like, hey, I think we can get Jason Alexander. I'm like, well, call him. Oh, you know, pound sand, I'm out of here. <laughs> And Chuck, even though you told me not to touch the mic, I'm moving it up oh and my down God, and that yanking mic. it. Do whatever you want. God. No, uh, so Peter and Jason Alexander, of course, George Costanza from Seinfeld, uh, they have a podcast. It's called uh, Really No Really. Yes. Uh, we're going to talk about that, but I'd, I really wanted to talk to you. because really? No, really. Oh, <laughs> really? I, I really you wanted to talk to you. You're overstating that, all right. Because not unlike my erstwhile uh Fake producer, uh, you have been friends with this guy, this Jason Alexander guy, for like most of your life. So I'm really interested to hear from somebody else who is working in close proximity <laughs> with a friend. Uh, or or is, he, is he a best friend? Is he an acquaintance? Is he like, tell me about your relationship. I really don't want to talk. I don't want to go. <laughs> Too this, painful. This I was on we the list of, about, of not approved topics. Oh, oh wasn't really. I no, talk, it wasn't. I'm about kidding. My ceramics, my new ceramics. We'll get no, there. No, no, no. We'll get there. Jason, the joke with Jason. I've known Jason since the second year of Seinfeld, and when we started this podcast, we had needed a hook because I didn't want to. I didn't want to do a podcast. I was, didn't. I did radio. I left radio after a, like a long career. How many years? And it was no, so friggin' long. Come on, give me like, a number. Like Twenty-seven Decades? years. Twenty-seven 20 years. Thirty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I left, and everybody's going, do a, my kids do a podcast, do a podcast, and I go. I had a million and a half people listening. I'm, well, I'm going to be like a kid in feet pajamas talking right. to who? I don't want to do a podcast. And they kept hawking me and hawking me to do it. And I came up with the idea, pitched it to Jason. He liked it. We sold it. And it's a way to, to hang with him. But when we sold it, I said, so the brand has to be mm. two best friends looking for answers to whatever questions there. And he, so every time we would do an interview, he goes, well, top five, top three, top two. You just moved up, so he. It hurts him to say that, but I think we're pretty. We're we're right there. We may be best friends. So essentially, I mean, I, just to say the same thing in a slightly different way. You had a relationship with a buddy for decades back, and you thought this it probably is monetizable, right? I mean, we we can probably actually sit down behind microphones and do the same stuff we do over lunch. And I'm assuming you've had more than a few lunches with Jason. Yeah. No. Yes and no. I said, if we can sell this, I'll do it. If there's no money, I'm not. Are you out of your mind? I can just, let's just eat. Um, and no, it's not. Because what I wanted to do was, like an idiot, there's, I thought there's a niche out there of mm-hmm. information with a little bit of humor. Because they're either informational shows or comedy shows. Didn't want to do a comedy show. Wanted to do something about informational with humor. Yeah. So I had I didn't realize I'd be doing all the heavy lifting. I didn't realize I'd be booking the guests, finding, doing whatever. So mm-hmm. it's not like sitting down over lunch, Chuck. There's venom and and there's also annoyance and there's animosity, and oh, yeah. it all shows in the podcast. Well, this is the eerily <laughs> this sounds familiar. Very, very familiar. Oh, yes. there you go. So you and Chuck have a similar relationship where there's guilt. Sure. Right. Okay. Projection. Good. Oh, I'm going to go. Ennui, deep. malaise, wow. resentment. So let me ask you a question. Sure. What symptoms? medicinally with Chuck show if you said you know I just don't want to do it anymore oh well in no particular order <laughs> look at his face they're, they're be, starting now that well denial we'd come right out of yeah. the gate with yeah, that exactly. the Elizabeth Kubler Ross the spectrum That's right. start okay so I mean Ross really would talk about <laughs> what it was grief bargaining denial anger and never get to accept it depression and eventually acceptance right now chuck would never get to accept this he'd be getting to keying your cars you go denial and then he'd go into a kind of a kind of a pouting mode 
that would be, I think, he's clinically. Saying no, he's saying he's so no. clinically, it would be kind of passive aggressive. Look at your face. There's you like talking about this a little bit. You like lifting the hood up. Chuck, Chuck you hearing this? You hearing this? Oh, he he loves nothing more than to than dressing me down. That's that's his favorite thing to do. <laughs> it's not my favorite thing to do, but I think <laughs> it's I, I think it's important. Uh, you know, for my own self actualization and. <laughs> it is important. I see it. We're, we're actually having a breakthrough early on. Think about think about how many arguments you've had with Jason oh, over man, the decades. Oh, man, dude. How okay. about the week? Fine. Fine. But what I'm getting at is, you know, friendships are, are, are precious. And For I don't sure. know about you, but I mean, all seriousness, uh, you know, the older you get, the more important 100%. the old friends become, right? And so a shorthand develops along with all of these other things that in a new relationship might be considered the kiss of death. Why would you hang out with somebody who is right. passive aggressive and defensive right. and uh, skeptical of all things that you say? You know, you wouldn't. You have to get to the point where those qualities actually become, uh, let's call them um, adjacent to endearing. You're right. You're right. It's, it's interesting because one of the episodes we're doing is with a bridesmaid who you, mm-hmm. you hire which is funny and interesting stories and all that stuff, but it's also, why would you need to hire a bridesmaid? Because and part of that is, no a lot friends. of people don't have, yeah. We no friends. And I didn't realize since COVID, people are pruning friends. In other words, mm. I haven't seen you in a while. I used to hang out with you. I used to do stuff with you, but you know what? I used to do it because we were close at work or whatever. So they're pruning friends. And it started in the 70s. Mm. And you, you can relate to this. In the 70s, there were all these clubs. Yeah. Rotary club, bowling club, they're gone. We don't do that stuff anymore. So that started it. And then COVID just kind of put a nail in it where people are looking at it going, you know what? I'm going to whittle this down a bit. Do you think that happened in part because of bad geography or laziness or like, why would someone shed a friend? You know, honestly, no joking. I think, I think it goes deep. I think it's multi-level, but I think part of it is what you said in a way. Isolation doesn't mean you're lonely necessarily. I don't know, but like, I like being isolated at times. Mm-hmm. And I think people su- were surprised by the isolation that, that for some people it was like, okay, I'm digging, I'm digging this a bit. Yeah. But I think to your point, that person, I liked them at that point, but it, looking at it now, a lot of work, a mm-hmm. little bit of aggravation. And you know, it's Friday night, you're calling to pizza. I, yeah, I don't think I want to. How many times have you done that? Or, or you've lied and said, I think I got COVID. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I've, used the, I've used the I think I got COVID thing yeah. two, three thousand times. Yeah. I'm not sure, but I tell you, not it sure, does. But I just want yeah, to protect you. But then it's protecting you, so it's you're out. But something else happened during the lockdowns, uh, and and I completely agree and relate to that. That happened in my life, but on an equal and opposite plane, I because we were isolated, I suddenly took a weird, borderline, unhealthy interest in my neighbors who I had by and large ignored. That's hilarious. Right? And so suddenly, like, we're in a bubble. So these people I see all the time. It's like, you know, we're walking around, we're picking up our requisite dog crap, right? And I was like, hey, you know what? Why don't you, why don't you come over? We'll sit outside six feet apart, have a beer, and get to know each other. And, and swap COVID. And swap COVID, yeah, of course. So, wow. But, I mean... I guess I'm just looking for a silver lining at the end of this this horror show, but I've got half a dozen relationships with people who are actually within half a mile well, of where you know I what, live. Chuck, I, honestly, I, it, I did. I'm Mike, by the way. I mean, That's Mike, Chuck Mike over there. there. I thought he was Mike talking to me. He looked sort of in this direction. He's still not sure who's ricochet. actually hosting it ric- the show. It was a ricochet, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Jason, go on with your story. Oh, by the way. Have at it. Um, we're all going to be there in 10 weeks anyway. I can remember my name. I said to my wife the other day, you know, because I'm forgetting names so much. I said, if I say, who's the little guy? Big hat, Sundays, huge crowd. She goes, Pope. I go, just hit me with a brick. At that point, hit me with a brick and take me out because I'm beyond repair at, at that point. But the, the neighbor thing, it's face to face. When you do yeah. Zoom. So I did a lot of Zoom interviews. Yeah. During COVID, where I would do um, Maniscalco and I would do this one and do it to groups. I couldn't see the thousand people watching, yeah. but all these speakers bureaus needed somebody who could do it, who could interview, move it along. I did a ton of them. I did Jim, Jim Gaffigan twice. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like I, and I liked him and it was great and it was fun. And I feel like I don't have a relationship with Jim Gaffigan. Right. And you're watching yourself as much as you're watching them just because that's the way it works. 
So there's a disconnect. The funniest thing is, with this back to work thing, I think I read that Zoom is making their employees come back to work. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Oh, that's <laughs> Isn't that great. And I, you should check that out. But I'm thinking, I'm almost, I'm almost thinking that, it's, that I got that right. That Zoom said, hey, guys, this isn't worth it. <laughs> you should be back in the office. So that's why the neighbors, they're there. Yeah. You get a sense of, but yeah. they've always been there. Yeah, but this now is there's the a crazy desperation. Thing. There's a different. It's a different thing. You're craving that. That. So but I think of it like, you know, isn't it interesting how more arranged marriages outlast the traditional kind? Right. It's something like, I don't know. Is that true? Oh yeah. I got a good friend who was arranged. He's Albanian. His wife came from Albania. He met her on their engagement day, and they have three beautiful children. Been together for twenty some years. I know him before. So he if got he married. cheats, does he have to have somebody else arrange that? The cheating. Is, I mean, is that just the psyche? <laughs> is that how you it's work? He's got a whole You're team. An yeah. arranged person. Yeah. Needs, hey, I want to step out. <laughs> who do I call? <laughs> My point is, I wonder if maybe. Part of our dysfunction as a species has to do with the fact that, you know, you've got 330 million people in this country. You can be friends with any of them, but that's a big palette and they're spread out and you're never going to meet all of them. But if, if somebody were to tell you, look, you can only be friends with the people within a quarter mile of where you live, well, suddenly you would be both more discriminating and more circumspect because you would want to meet them all. And yeah, you but would... like an arranged marriage, you're mm -hmm. already in a neighborhood with people who probably are similarly income level, education level. You know what I mean? So there's already that. You've already cut through that. So there already may be commonalities that that are quickly accelerated because sure. you can talk to somebody about something. Whereas if you meet somebody at a bar, you go, yeah. "He has no idea what I'm saying." Right. So so that. And how many of those are sustained that you really like of those people? Well, a sh a, a shocking number, like lockdowns ended and we could have all gone back to the prior life but now we're kind of used to each other and so there are little routines that are built in to the month right fridays right. here tuesdays there and do you ever feel like now you're obligated to well that? you know <laughs> has it become yeah, that yet has it become that yet i mean uh, uh, what's that has it become that yet I'm no not, and i wasn't saying that jokingly but as we expand back i don't know mm. that we're ever going to get i asked jason a lot am i the same because i'm, I'm more hair trigger Am I more tent? Like, how do I come? Because I want to know. Because I've been sitting in my second bedroom doing podcasting for how long now? <laughs> I don't know how I'm coming off. Am I what I used to be? Did COVID change me? I'm fascinated yeah, yeah, to yeah, find yeah. out if how I've changed. Well, look, we, we are desperate for feedback. We're, we're desperate to know how we're doing, right? So as a broadcaster, you know, I mean, you must hate it. But surely you know about Arbitron. Surely you look oh at God. Nielsen. To, surely you yes, know about yes, like yes. so. I mean, all of that is just the the mechanics of feedback in our industry. But right. we're also desperate for feedback from our friends and yes. from our lovers yes. and from and blah, blah blah blah. But I want to know. I want to know if I become more of an asshole. I don't know about you, but getting older, mm -hmm. a couple things have happened. <laughs> it's like dumb stuff. Like the sock goes on running. Goes son of a. I'm cursing about. Yeah. That, the towel falling, is I'm becoming my grandfather. I'm definitely, definitely becoming my grandfather. And I, got, I don't know why, and it's bugging me. I got to tell you this. this tell, tell me if this has happened either, you guys. I'm walking through the airport, not a week ago. I'm a little late. I'm approaching the gate. I'm pulling my, my carry-on, and I've got my knapsack on top of it, right? Like everybody does. Well, the knapsack falls off, and I'm holding it and pulling the thing at the same time. So it, it rolls and twists in my hand, and it's heavy. And this has happened so many times, and it's always annoyed me. But on this particular day, I spun around, and I kicked, I kicked my carry-on as hard as I could. <laughs> and I, I said some really impolite words in, in, my, in my outside voice. I, like, I, I, I snapped, Peter. I, I, I snapped. I get, I get it. I totally get it. And I don't know if that's an age thing or if it's a societal thing at point because we're frustrated with other stuff. But I'm really attuned to that. Because I always tell, tell my kids, you know what? We do a lot of charity. You do a lot of charity. I do it because I need to be loved, I guess. And mm -hmm. I do it because I feel I'm a schmuck if I don't. But I always say to my kids, if somebody cuts you off and you give them the finger, it's going to accelerate to that. But watch what happens if you go, it's okay, and smile. It diffuses it instantly. Totally. Yeah. Instantly. Dude, it, that, okay. So put and that so on it's so easy a... to do, but it's easy to do. And I know it sounds saccharine and all, but I, I really don't want to become that answer. I don't want to go down that route. Yeah. Where I'm get, get, the, get off the lawn guy. So to be able to like reset the table in your mind, you know, back to the airport, that same journey, I'm on a plane 
And I'm sitting next to a guy who's wearing a mask, and he offers me a mask. And he said, would you like to put this on? And I said, I said, thanks, no, but I'm good. And inside, immediately, there was this collision of ideas. How dare you? What's wrong with you? Why don't you live your life and let me live mine? I, I mean, you got to be kidding me. And then he takes the mask he offered me, and he puts it over the mask he's already wearing. Now he's doubled up. Good thinking sitting next to a guy with two masks on and I'm going to be sitting next to him for about five hours. So I need to, I, I need to have some level of back to Kubler Ross. Am I going to be angry, depressed? Am I going to be in denial about all this stuff? You know? And then I thought, what if he's sick? What if he's got, there you go. What if he feels like there's something going on in his throat and and, and he just wants to protect the people around him? Like or that. that he feels you're so toxic. I need to mask. But <laughs> you're right. Like, I, but hey, it's a dirty other, jobs guy. Maybe the, you want to wrap yourself in bubble pack. But, but you know what? That's the other thing. Everybody, you find out. I talk to everybody. I don't know if you're like that. My wife cracks up because every restaurant we go to, they know me. Because I a waitress comes up, somebody comes up and goes, having a good day, bed. Is it a rush? I want to find, I need to travel through cultural time and space by talking to people. It's fun. I guess I grew up in a European home where kids should be seen but not heard. Yeah. So I was stifled for so many years. I love doing that. And you watch people light up when you ask them about stuff because they don't get to be heard often. But I always tell my kids the same thing. Everybody's carrying a 50-pound bag of cement. Everybody. Has a kid with cancer, has a friend who's not, has something going on if you go one level below. So for you to go there, because I'm not that evolved, I would probably have gone the whole flight going, son of a bitch. God, I can't believe that. Son of, I would have probably found another mask. I would ask the flight attendant for another <laughs> mask. One more three. And give let's them, triple yeah, it. Let's go for the third. Why take chances? I hear two. Yeah, dude. You know, these filtration systems. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Let's go back to the lunch you mentioned you had with Jason after, was it the first episode of the first season of Seinfeld? The the beginning of the second season, as I recall. And the reason I'm asking you is because you've been in this business for a very long time, with respect. Um, and, And I'm guessing that you don't know anybody who hit it that hard. And that amazingly, right? I mean, I, I don't know how many other friends you I have. Know a bunch of friends who <laughs> do, do you really? And I'm like, the, yeah, I'm the radio guy going, wow, that's really fun to watch. Who's bigger than Jason Alexander? In well, your but give in a different way. Like Billy Bob Thornton won an Oscar. Yeah, he's big. You know, that's pretty, that was pretty big. You're doing a podcast with a, him? Amazing guy. No, he won't return. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but Jason, that would, yeah, that's enormous. Oh, well, you know, the other person that I'm close with, but he's quiet about it and doesn't do stuff much now is Homer Simpson, Dan Castellaneta. Oh, he's like my kid's godfather. He's terrific. And he's wonderful and lovely, but low key, low down and doesn't kind of go out there and publicize it. But you, I mean, how many years? Oh my God. 30, it was the I longest think running sitcom. The 33rd maybe? year. He and, so he and Deb became really close friends, but it's in a different, it's a different way. So, but I want to talk about the lunch where, I mean, I, I don't know if this happened at lunch, but like when you realize you might have a tiger by the tail, Right? I mean, it's super interesting. And, and, and when you're watching that happen for your friend, that's super interesting too. I think. Yeah, it was, it's weird because I don't look at Jason as that guy. It's really, it really weird. Yeah. Um, at all. At all. It doesn't, because he's such a good guy. And I like him because of who he is and not because of that. We also came up with two TV shows together that weren't that. Mm. We've been through the war together. I was in intensive care and almost died. He's gone through stuff, family stuff, kid stuff. So that's, that's. Even when I turn it on now and I'm changing channels and I see him, I love it. He's so, nobody plays annoyed, funnier than that human being, okay? But I don't see him as that because he's not, he's not that. So even the thing that, that hit me about how big it was, because I've done sitcoms before you've been on set, was Seinfeld when it took off. I went to the set. Mm-hmm. And I've never seen craft services. I mean, all my shows have. They have like, like, donut. Li- like a red licorice thing, yeah. a, a bowl of, like a thing of licorice, a donut, <laughs> a zagnut. and then something else. And you're asking for, can I have uh. maybe a piece of bread? <laughs> Seinfeld, the table went, you couldn't see the end of it. There were clouds. Yeah. And they had anything anybody wanted to eat at all was there. Crock pots, roasting, things, sushi, because it doesn't matter when you're, when you're that. So, and the other part of that was watching them work. There was so much, le- they, they were having such a good time. Yeah. And once something hits like that, man, the audience, everybody's having a good time. When it, did it, they know? 
that it Jason was it. tells it that it was during the, I think it was the, I may get this wrong and people are going to yell at me who are Seinfeld fans, but it was a masturbation episode, which was the contest. The contest. Uh. And Jason said it was the first time where you could actually see numbers going up. They could see numbers going up during the episode because people were calling people mm-hmm. and uh. saying, you got to check this out. And boom. And then it went. But Larry, Jason tells fire was left three times, quit three times. Yeah. Because, and, and for the reason, and I got it, and I wish I would have thought to say this, the network, they give you, you've had this too, the network notes. Sure. Okay, and I've had two networks in a studio give me notes, so you got nine people mm-hmm. contradicting each other and telling me what to do, and meanwhile, I'm looking in, in my phone to see if I can buy a gun without a, <laughs> without a waiting period for myself to blow myself up. But, but what Larry said, which was really interesting, he said, I'm quitting, and they say, why? And he said, because I can't do, if you want a person to do that, what you're saying, hire that person. I, what I do is this. Right. How do you fight that? I can't do that. That's changing, though, isn't it? I mean, aren't the, the suits, uh, as it were, getting less and less involved? You know what, Chuck? I have been so not close to selling anything recently. The no, last but, thing I thought, but, but, I but, think, you're, but you and Jason are doing your own podcast. Mike and I are doing this podcast. It's like so many people are on their own nowadays and sort of cutting the cord to the studio well, because, or you the had network. A whole, you had a life, you talked about it before, of getting notes from people. I had 52 yeah. different program directors and one was good. Right. Um, and you'd have to sit and listen. And as you get older... Instead of getting crazy and cursing and going nuts, I, I, I at least became an adult and go, they're hearing out of the car speaker while they're driving and doing, why mm. are they hearing it that way? Maybe there is something valid there. 10%, 20 so I go, let me use it right. instead of negate it. Yeah. But still, when you have a hit show like that. The only, see, I looked at notes as a, as a form of focus group. And I had always thought of a focus group as the lowest form of science right a terrific way to get rid of all the bad ideas and all the great ideas and it's focus group right just the squishy middle is right. left when you get notes from one person might be a lifesaver you get notes from nine there's simply no way right because you you're going to put it all together into some unholy bully base and distill it down into into something right and what do you what do you do with that I mean, how do you even think about it? It chips away also, like the Seinfelds of the world, the shows that are most successful are usually close to being a singular voice. You know what I mean? That, that wasn't interrupted. Because mm. it made them laugh. One guy once at a table, you know how you have the table where you're doing it? Would go, hey, stop, stop doing what you're doing. Let's get back to work. And the guy next to me go, no, this, is, that's, we should, this should be the show, not yeah. what we're going to get back to. Because everybody right. goes back into that mode of, here's what a sitcom is and here's... But to Chuck's question, I don't know what this looks like anymore because a lot of these shows are eight and ten episodes now. Yeah. And six. actors, yeah, or six. I don't know what that looks like, what that feels like, yeah. what the pay is like, what the networks are like. Well, I look how long it took for Seinfeld to find its rhythm. Right. I mean, right? It was that it was roundly considered sort of a failure in season. It was one. the lowest testing that come in NBC history, which tells you about your focus groups and testing. Huh. And may, if, don't ever go do you, have you ever watched one of your shows be tested uh no but i've i have heard the stories it's we had a show called bob patterson that i came up with which was a motivational, motivational speaker, speaker who couldn't motivate his that family. was you that was, that was me yeah so i it was me and jason and i wanted to do that, that area sheet. so big i wanted to do that so badly so i got jason on board we did we had a great pilot thank god written with mike marker which is a genius and and we went to the testing and I had some great lines in there. I had some really funny stuff in there, stuff I loved and stuff. And we had one scene, which was almost an embarrassment. We had a, a woman, I hate to say it, with the water, the water girl coming in. And the line was, look at those jugs. Mm-hmm. I don't even know how it made it into the pilot because I'm so embarrassed. And right. the people in the room who were kind of with the dial, the meter going up and down, eh, when she walked in and that, that line, they pinned it to the right. Like that was the thing they liked the most. That was it. That's and I said to Jason... I don't know that I can continue. <laughs> I got to get out of here. I can't breathe. I submit for your consideration married with children. <laughs> I mean, that, that's... But married with children, were, that made the Fox Network. Yeah. Did you ever go to those tapings? I never went to one. Dude, I got it, first of all, because they pushed the envelope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Second of all, you've gone to a taping of a sitcom? Oh, yeah. How far back does the audience sit? Um, pretty, let's pretty, see. Pretty. I was in one with Tim Allen, and they were up maybe maybe 30 feet it's bleachers yeah. it's, but it's, it's, bleachers. Away. it's away it's away oh yeah yeah married with children you're sitting 
you almost in the set. It's like a theater done, in the round. You're right there. You're right. You're oh, two that's seconds great. Two, an inches from them. Were you drinking and eating? Go for it. I mean, they wanted that thing to be a party. It was the Golden and Globes. It was. It was. Yeah. It was insane. It was, <laughs> right? it, was, it was. It was insane because they wanted to break the wall. They wanted to do different stuff, and they wanted the audience to be involved. So you, you hear that. There's hooting. There's yelling. There's all mm -hmm. kinds of crap going on there. The audience was right there, right on top of them, and that's when the Simpsons started. That's that made Fox Network married with children and Simpsons. You know, I heard a story once. Um, Tim Allen. He ran a really tight ship on Last Man Standing. Like, they would, you know, I went through the week of rehearsals and stuff. I played his younger brother, and the night we shot it, I mean, we were done, I think, before, like, 9.30. Like, you know, I mean, they really shot it like a play. And um, a couple people just pulled me aside later and said, you have to appreciate how unusual this is. And they told me a story about friends and how it was not uncommon to be there at two in the morning, still writing new lines, still trying just, and I just can't imagine just the soul I've on dead. shows that have been there till one. It, it's really hard because it's diminishing. And I said to my wife, not that I don't like the process or wasn't thrilled. I mean, I'm from Philly, from a row home in Philly. I never thought I'd be out here. So I'm all of this stuff, even the worst of it, I still can't believe I got to be part of. You watch TV as a kid and you fantasize about this and then you're there. On Universal, driving into the Universal Studios lot, and the hair is going back up the back of your neck, going, I can, cannot believe I'm here. But what I saw with the, the writing, it becomes diminishing. It mm -hmm. becomes diminishing returns. And I said to my wife, after doing it for years, what I'm doing is trying to do jokes and guessing what's in the showrunner's head, not what I think is funny. And I don't even know half the stuff they're pitching the room, they're laughing about. I don't even know what they're, I really don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. And then I'd watch the sitcom and go, Oh, it's not that funny. But in the room, there's politics going on, people laughing at other people's jokes that are close, and they're not laughing at you. All of that stuff, which is fine. It's the industry. But I just couldn't do it anymore where I'm trying to guess what's, what he thinks is funny, which is his right, the showrunner. So that's when I went out and sold. We did Bob Patterson. Mm -hmm. And then we did the thing called Hit the Road, <laughs> which was right before COVID, which I always thought would be fascinating because I did country music for a bunch of years. And the country artist, Jamie O'Neill, always used to tell me that her family, it was a family band. And they would be just off the stage, two inches from the curtain going, you will suck you, I, you know, uh, and then in two seconds, it's America. Is it? And then they go back to fighting. And I thought, sure. what a great thing that is, being trapped with your family on a bus. And you know too much about sex, drugs, and rock and roll that your kids are doing. Oh, man. They know, yeah, exactly. And then, by the way, we did it. And then COVID. And then COVID. Yeah. Yeah. And the first thing I did after the lockdowns was a show called Road Trip. R-O-W-E-D, because I'm wow. terribly clever that way. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, how funny to, uh, to suddenly be in that space where I was so desperate to do something. I didn't care what it was. I, I think we did the first Zoom show in prime time about three weeks into the lockdowns. Wow. wow. It wasn't very good. Uh, but it was as good as it could be. It was me interviewing crab boat captains, you know, up in the Barrington. Oh, that's sea. right. Okay, can I ask you a question about sure. that? yeah. So I, I love reality television because, again, how you like, I could see me going in and selling Dr. Pimple Popper. Like, sure. what? It really, it sold? What, what? I can draw a line, by the way, from an episode of Dirty Jobs to that show. But go ahead, because. Well, your series, you did a series like that with oh, yeah. Horseshoes to Love where you went the whole six degrees. So I got it. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> I watched the crab thing and I go, wow, these guys are killing themselves. But the crew with the camera, that's why we, we got an adventure cameraman on because we had, I said, forget him. You're running backwards in the waves. You're going to die. What is that like for the crew? Do they do draw like bad straws to get the, that assignment on? We didn't know early on what it was. Um, I was trying to sell dirty jobs and they didn't want it. It was a talk show in a sewer, essentially. And <laughs> that was the accusation. And, oh, that uh, you know, is wonderful. Guilty as charged. I said, yeah, it is. But they said, we've got this thing um, up off the Pribilof Islands in the Bering Strait that might be interesting. They showed me the footage and we went up. And basically, it might have been a dock. It might have been a series. It might have been a limited series. We didn't know what we were shooting. Right, right. So I'm working like part Stone Phillips, part uh, Greenhorn, you know. And the crew that was up there, honestly, they just didn't. They, it's difficult enough to film a frenetic scene right. like that. But put it in 30-foot swells 
with sleet coming in sideways, and you got cameramen doing full planks in yeah, midair, yeah. hitting the ground like a. I mean, right. it was shocking. It was it was shockingly chaotic and violent, and the only way to shoot it was for everybody to go wide and shoot everything. Wow. And then yeah. lock down some GoPros on some relatively stable things. And let that things. pick up the stuff that's dangerous. Wow. Because I watched that. It, oh. A, it, not to knock it, but it kind of looks like the same show every week. Because it's like, sure. say, it is the same. And after 10 episodes, I'm going, why am I still, still watching this? Because I want to see the win. I want to see. Because it's like my, the joke that a comedian used to do when I was growing up. Where the guy used to sit at home on Sundays and watch the fishing show and yell, Ma, we caught one. <laughs> it's, it's, it's part of it is that. Right. It's the win. You, you, can, you can share the human drama that we brought the crowds back and we made a half a million bucks and oh, we figured it out. We beat nature. So let me take it. Maybe tell me if I'm wrong, but for me, it, was, it wasn't the fact that it was windy. It was the fact that you didn't know when it was going to be windy. You can't script the Bering Sea. Right. Right. And we were entering a time when every single thing in reality TV was going to be focus grouped. It was going to be uh, weighed and measured. And every showrunner was going to look at this thing called reality through the lens of a sitcom producer. Right. Because that's really what they wanted right, to be. Right, right. Right. And so, you know, suddenly reality became the opposite of reality but you can't script the Bering Sea. So just when you think you got your story arcs figured out and your main characters are galvanized and you think you know what's going to happen with the season, a freaking boat sinks and six men die. And you go, oh, we're not in charge of this thing, are right. we? The viewers can sense that and, and they crave it. Not death. They crave no, it's real. authenticity, well, 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 honesty. Reality shows ought to be real. Or Nobody talks like sitcoms, set up jokes, set up jokes. So all of a sudden, reality shows came out. And they went, okay, this is how I talk. This is how people talk. It feels real. But I got to ask you as, you, were, as you were talking about that, I wonder about you, because you did Dirty Jobs. You did that. You did a lot of stuff. I interviewed William Macy recently, and he said, as an actor, when you're in your 20s, you take roles because they could change the world and be something. <laughs> in your 40s, you do it because it's interesting and it can pay. And then when you get into your 50s and 60s, you say, well, I have to get wet. <laughs> um, so so to, your, to you, you're a really talented guy. I've seen you do a lot of different stuff, and I really am a fan of, well, of your work. And it's, it's not easy, okay? But I was wondering about getting wet. Did you ever want to just do a show and you go, I just want to host a show. I want to be Johnny Carson. I want to be this. And I don't want to have to be in a sewer. I don't want to have to be on a crab boat. Why the hell did I get myself into this world where I can sell shows that are th this or this adjacent, but they don't see me as part of this? Because you do other stuff too. I did for 15 years, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, game shows, talk shows, sitcoms, pilots. Evening magazine. QVC. QVC. <laughs> I did, I mean, a lot. I Close to 300 jobs before Dirty Jobs. Wow. Hit. But... I mean, the short answer is I, I fancied myself a pretty facile host. Like, I could create the illusion of competence in short bursts. I could hit the X. I could memorize the information on a plaque at Gettysburg, and then I could look at the camera, and I could spit it back out as though I actually knew that before I showed up. And that's basically what I was paid to do, that and narrate. And, and yeah, but I'm watching you do this, and... The way you do it and the relatability factor and the everyman factor is really, a lot of people can't do that. Well, I was 42 and I realized that I had a, I had an okay career and I kind of, I still kind of liked being a host, but Dirty Jobs didn't need a host. It needed a guest. Mm. It needed an avatar. And once I realized, oh, oh, like uh, the, it's a big Johnny Carson lesson. He was very generous with his guests. Because 100%. he knew he'd be back the next day. Hmm. And Buddy Hackett would be off doing well, what John else. would say is, and Carson's lying, because I studied that too, was doesn't matter if you get the laugh or I get the laugh, they're going to say, so on Carson. That's it. <laughs> That's exactly right. And I can't, I can't say that that occurred to me that cogently, but at some point in the sewer in San Francisco, when the rat jumped off my shoulder, landed in my crotch and sent me leaping skyward only to knock myself nearly unconscious and fall face first in a river of crap. Somewhere in the middle of that miasma uh, was the realization that this is kind of funny and we're learning things and it doesn't matter if the jokes is, is on me. In fact, it's better right. that it's on me and not 
and not that guy, right? And so that was a that was a weird thing to sort of realize relatively late in my career. And once I realized it, once I realized it, Peter, it you got a like, brand. Oh yeah, and like back to Doctor Doctor uh, Pimple Popper. I I can't prove this, but we were in a tannery, and we were preparing hides that had been recently removed from deer. And we were scraping the fat off of the inside of the hide, and I came across a sebaceous cyst, which is very common on the inside of the skin of deer. It's about the size of a quarter and stood up maybe half an inch. And it looked like it was filled with the kind of contagion that you neither wanted to see nor sniff. So So you you had to show it. You had to squeeze it out. It wasn't just that, Chuck. It was, we made a meal of this thing. I'm not saying we ate it. Thank God. I'm saying we spent roughly nine minutes setting up a shot. We had just got a high-speed camera. We had the macro setting. I aimed this thing. I squeezed this thing. And that hot, disappointing, toothpaste-like custard that came flying out of that was played back multiple times with the appropriate music under it. And who knew that in this, in this country are many millions of people who really enjoy that? Like, but really? you knew instinctively. I was but, just no, trying we, to fill no, it no, out. Wait, 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 wait. If we go, <laughs> let's go back even further to QVC, because I understand that you got fired a couple of times, and, and the word has it you were showing dolls, and you had a nun, a nun doll, was it? I did have a nun doll, yeah. And Sister you did Mary things, Margaret. I won't say, I, you say what you did, but, no, but. Wait a minute, you're the guest, dude. So go <laughs> easy. I know your instinct is to ask probing questions. No, but, but I just, fa- it take, oh, you don't want me to follow the story where it's taking me. I think follow the story by all means. All right. But, but don't say, Mike, tell me another amusing story. No, but it's, but, it's, but it's, you took <laughs> over. On QVC, you weren't just selling stuff because on some level, it's the guy who knows that that, that thing needs to be popped. Sure. You're at QVC going, you know what? This is chugging along, but you know what? I see opportunity. Oh yeah, and you did. That's but that's but not everybody does that. Not everybody yeah, but gets look, that. It's revisionist history, Peter. I looking back, I can tell you now that everything worth knowing, every useful skill in my stupid little toolbox in this crazy industry, I learned at QVC. I didn't know it at the time. All I knew at the time was it was two in the morning. And I had to talk for eight minutes at a time about an item that was brought to me by a product coordinator that I had never seen before. I didn't even know that they were real. The Health Team Infrared Pain Reliever. The Amcor Negative Ion Generator. I love to see this. I don't know. Aren't you happy everybody listening to the guest that the guest had had this story brought up? That's because it's fascinating. It's how people become who they are and have an awareness. Well, look, let's, let's do a shameless pivot. And get back to Joan Rivers. Since, yeah, since, yeah, since you invoked yeah. her name, um, you know, the two, three dozen listeners we have at this point on a regular basis will probably know the story. But Joan, Joan saved my career. I mean, she hired me after my third firing. And I don't want to drag you through all the details of that, but I want to know why she mattered to you and what she did or said that might have changed the trajectory of your own misspent She would, you get, you get who she was. I, we, I was very lucky. She came on my show early on and we hit it off. Radio show. Radio show. Mm-hmm. Melissa was with her and she said, so uh, what about, and it just so happened, I lived two blocks away from them, okay? So she started calling me to go out to dinner and we have a Chinese restaurant where we live and every week she would Sunday night, maybe we do Chinese. Then she wanted me to work on fashion police and work with other stuff and I didn't want to do that. I was too busy doing radio whatever. But she said, please, come. I said, well, I don't want to be hired by them. I don't want to write the show. Can we just do it? I'll do it if it's just you and me. So I go over every Wednesday morning and sit on the floor in her bedroom and work, write jokes, make her laugh, and just, just play. Oh, my which God. Which was like the most magical thing. But what you will learn about Joan is, everybody saw Joan as this character. Yeah. We were actually launching a dog food when she died because I wanted to get her off the road a bit. And wait, my, wait, wait, wait. Launching a dog we, we food? Launched a do- we were launching a dog food when she died. A friend of mine had owned a major brand, had sold it, was not allowed to go back in the business anymore, and I was fascinated in doing some of this with Joan, and she loved dogs. So, sorry, you, sorry, your friend was not allowed to go back in the dog no, no, food no, because business? We, we, after you bought, he had a five-year 
Oh, well, I yeah, see. Well, I you're see. not allowed to do it. It wasn't for like inappropriate uh, no, 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 jokes. He did great stuff. What were the he circumstances? Did great stuff. So I said to John, we should do it. We we developed it. We had an order for a lot of money, and then she died. Yeah. So it was heartbreaking because we did we did vacations together. What I learned from her because she wasn't that person that you saw that big. Everybody loved her. Fashion Police was young people. QVC was middle aged, and the Carson crowd was older. And she bridged all of that. She was fearless. But what she taught me was, she flew in every Wednesday, Chuck, red eye. Mike. We'd Mike. get a Mike. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. It's okay. We've been talking a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we got a lot going on. We have been talking a lot, and I got to let go of that. I do have to let go <laughs> you of that. Do. Chuck, you're you dead do. to me. I'm going to rip my clothes. <laughs> like <laughs> what Neil Shiva. Diamond did in the movie, The yeah. Jazz Singer. Um, good reference. So, <laughs> a deep cut. Dude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the one person who went, wow, he made a Neil Diamond yeah. Jewish ripping your clothing reference. It's only a matter Chuck. of time. Chuck's dead, but what? Happened? Well, he's done. I don't even know he's sitting over there. <laughs> so she would fly in every week, get off the plane, write with me, mm-hmm. write with the writers. I would watch her eyes start to close, and she'd wake herself up, go like it's twelve o'clock. Get up at three, go to hair and makeup, shoot fashion police, get on a plane, and go back, and I never, in years and years and years, heard her complain or mentioned jet lag. She wouldn't complain, and if I said. Hey, I think I got the flu. Give it to me, sweetheart, because I can lose some weight. She didn't want complaining. She didn't whatever. She just worked harder than anybody I've ever met, more focused than anybody I ever met, and cared about every fan. We would pull out of a gig. She would take everything from the dressing room <laughs> and give it to people. All right. Everything that wasn't nailed down. That's and great. we'd be in the car, and it's pouring rain. And we pull out, and there's 20 fans standing in the pouring rain. And she says, hold on, stop. Get out with the umbrella and stand with every single one of them. Give them a QVC bracelet. Do something. Yeah. And say, if they're waiting for me, and she meant it, mm-hmm. then I'm there for them. She was so that person and helped a lot of people. But her work ethic, I never saw anybody work so hard to make it look so easy. I'm so glad to hear you say that. Um, not because I doubted it, but because I hadn't thought about it. I mean, 25 years after I met Joan, we launched the Work Ethic Scholarship Program. And... Um, I, you know, I talk a lot about dirty jobbers. I talk a lot about the the people who have inspired that endeavor, including my mom and dad and my and my grandfather. But yeah, you're right, man. Joan Rivers was always there early. She always stayed late. She was a very generous performer. She was funny. She made my bosses extraordinarily uncomfortable. There was no there was no delay on QVC. There was no seven second magical thing (laughs) it was joan without a net you know and nobody nobody there had seen that level of uncertainty and uh (laughs) ribbledness i mean it just and and she reined it in obviously she knew what she she was so smart you know what she said so there were a couple points in her life um qvc was one of the low points because the show went away, and I don't want to get too much into that, but she said, everybody told her, you're selling tchotchkes. Yeah. Don't do it. It's horrible. Red carpet. You're going to be on the red carpet because you're not a star interviewing stars. And Joan would say, am I like the Kurt? Well, I, yeah, say whatever. Say F, screw it. And oh, within a short period of time, the red carpet became a thing. Mm-hmm. She got paid a fortune to do it, that multi-year contract for her and Melissa, because she figured out the work that had to go in to doing that making a thing. QVC, I'm going to sell tchotchkes. It's going to kill my career. Over a billion dollars later, it didn't kill her career, and it opened her up to the heartland. Everybody who watched QVC loved her. Yeah. So she had a whole other audience, and they got that. She would bring my wife stuff all the time. I watch. You know, this is the same movement as a, as a thing, because I made sure that the guy, she was, she was that focused on making that good. Yeah. So she didn't phone in anything. She was on top of the product. She was on top of sales. She was on top of everything she did, and she did it with such gusto and care when we would go out to dinner to the chinese restaurant here's joan rivers the big star and everybody in the restaurant would go whatever she'd sit across from my son robert robert are you getting contacts whatever she didn't talk about herself ever she wanted to know everybody else's thing what's the good book what should i know about this what should i know about this person mm. how about that she wanted to stay current and she was magic she was for me it's really hard i still miss her and it's been a year oh man because well, she was so magic so i uh I went to her Christmas party when she was on Fifth Avenue. One the year. house, that place. That place. Oh, my God. It was like a church. It was an enormous old brown. So it was magnificent. And uh, I told my mother I was going to go over to Joan Rivers for Christmas. She's like, oh, 
it's amazing. What are you taking her? What kind of gift? I'm like, God, I haven't thought about it. What am I going to bring Joe? And she says, I'll make cookies. My mother baked a bunch of cookies and gave them to me. We go up in that elevator and I come out and there's Joan looking like just the, you know, the queen. And everybody's there. Barry Diller's there, Diane von Furstenberg, all the swells. And Joan walks up and she says, I'm so glad you made it. And I said, honestly, I, I wouldn't miss it. And I said, my mom, my, my mom made you some chocolate chip cookies. And I swear, she took them and she looked at me and without a, without a hint of pretense or humor or irony, she just said, that is so kind. And you're like, gonna make me you're, like I'm a tear, like her. a tear in her eye. She and, cared, and she took him and she walked him over and put him by a menorah. <laughs> and I was just like, if my mom could see this, you know, it doesn't. She, chocolate she chip was cookies. he was really that. I mean, it is hard. I can't listen to the phone messages. I still have him on the machine. You're kidding. It's still hard to look at her. See, she was so special. She was such an amazing. It's old school. That whole generation of entertainers, performers who worked that hard who were gracious, who understood the crowd and worked so hard for the right joke. She would say, I'm going on the Tonight Show or whatever. I need two heavies and one light, meaning <laughs> two that people will talk about the next day. Not right. funny, yeah. two that people will talk about and we can't, she can't settle. So she's working it, working it, working because she has to deliver every time. She's amazing. One, one Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Prime time. I was seven o'clock. I was called in to fill in. For, that's the only time I ever saw prime time. It's like, <laughs> 7.30 in the evening, maybe there are a million people watching, the phones are busy, and I'm standing there just trying, you know, for once, trying not to get fired. I'm trying to do a good job, but I was called in sort of last minute, and I looked like an unmade bed, and I know this because Joan just walked onto the set in the middle of a pitch, and she said, you look like an unmade bed, and I said, you look amazing, and she came over, she straightened my tie, and she said, I don't look amazing, and I said, actually, you do, and she said, please, honey. One more facelift, and I'm going to have a goatee. Yeah. <laughs> and That's a good joke. Was... And no one knew where to look. <laughs> oh my no God. one knew what to say. Oh, my God. And she just walked off. And, like, her hair was in curlers. Like, she was getting ready for her thing. That's, but that's, she's vain, but not vain. She's, yeah. she acts as if she doesn't care, and she's Eddie, but she cares. She cares. Peter, I have a question about Joan. I'm really busy with the... Uh, oh, with Mike? Saying, oh, sorry. I'm chucked too. I hear oh. a voice. I hear a voice from where? You're dead <laughs> from, to me. Did from you not heaven. see me rip a I'm perfectly good hoodie? I'm coming to he from, to you from heaven. Yes, sir. Um, I've heard people say that uh, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel is based upon her. Is that true? I've heard, you know, I don't know because I don't know the writers. I should ask Jason because he's been on there. I'm sure part of it is just mm -hmm. because of what... It How was a time be? she was around Lenny Bruce. I right. Mean, she like the, yeah, the whole thing is her... And it's kind of that rhythm, but I don't know. It could be Toadie Fields. Could be yeah, you know, right. There, there were uh, it could be uh, who else? There were a couple women that time. But yes, I like to think it was. There's another one out with Gene Smart mm. that oh. kills me because there are moments that feel like that well, remind me of moments where she plays a comedian and she's got mm. um, a kind of a writer that she's adopted that goes on the road with her. If only we had. That, if you watch that, you Mike, you'll see, you'll get a feel for that. It will, you'll because it's, it's really heartfelt. And there's a bit of anger there, and there's a bit of her attitude there. And Gene Smart does it really well. So, how did all this happen to you? Like, what was know. the, you know, did you start radio? Did you start TV? Go go back. I'm a to kid the in age. Philadelphia who doesn't know what I want to be. But kids should be, you know, seen and not heard. I had no idea. I did all these like you jobs, sold industrial strapping, you know, <laughs> and driving around all of Jersey and, and New York. Giving these guys, if you don't know what industrial strapping is, you, you take a giant out, pallet yeah. and yeah. You, you get the FMC machine mm -hmm. and you pull it tight and it's mm -hmm. bands that go around the thing and you give it to the plant foreman and you come back two weeks later and it's broken <laughs> and it happens to every plant you go and you say to your boss, how come? And they say, because the other company is giving the guy Christmas presents and stuff, so just keep doing it. And I went, see you later. Yeah. Um, worked in a factory where I told you before, the Frank Sheeran was my, the Irishman, was my union representative. <laughs> So that was a bit of a rough place. What was cart. the movie that really was it? Was it the Irishman? It was, it was the Irishman. Irishman. Yeah, yeah, yeah Frank Sheeran. Yeah, not like not like the real Frank, but <laughs> so I worked. I did that. Did a lot of other jobs. Didn't know what I wanted to be. I was just listless. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't know what to do. Went to college, studied physiology, tried this, tried that, and then I just gravitated toward a job at a radio station. So somebody got me a job at a radio station, and I'm in sales, and I'm driving around, and I'm working my ass off. And I go to a flight school and go up in the plane. 
I'm down and I actually sold them a schedule on this radio station, Wi Fi 92 in Philadelphia. And when I came back, my general manager said, I can't believe that you sold that. And that's when I found out after three months that every other person had a list that they were given of ad agencies and accounts to survive. And I basically said, what the hell? And I wanted to quit. And they said, no. And they gave me a raise. And what happened accidentally was I would go, I, I never felt creative or smart, but I would go to an advertiser and go, you know, your ads really suck. Mm-hmm. We should do this. Mm-hmm. And they go, well, can you write it? And I go, yeah. And I produce it. And it became kind of known. And then I go, well, Philly's small. They use the same voiceover guy all the time. So you write something good, but it's the same nine people. Hmm. New York is a train right away. I go to New York and hire, I don't know if you know, I mean, big actors to do voiceover so they could sell. And you know voiceover. Mm -hmm. It really matters who's doing it and the time. So all of a sudden, I'm getting Amtrak. I did Urban Outfitters. I did Yamaha. And I'm getting kind of known. So you're writing copy. I'm writing and then producing. I started an agency. Now I'm doing media buying. I hired a person to do media buying. I hired a guy to do store display, you know, to work with me who did department stores change their displays. Oh, yeah. So that was a big job. That's and a fascinating business, Fascinating by the way, business. Man. And Bill Hollander, who was an older guy, came into my business. So I had all these people working with me and it grew. And then I started doing something for stuff for radio, imaging radio. And I used G. Gordon Liddy mm-hmm. and, um, oh God, who was Tip O'Neill for WBMW, which was launching in Washington, D.C. It was going to be a, like cool music. Mm-hmm. And I had, uh, what's his name, Tip O'Neill on the steps of the Capitol with his pant legs rolled up with a boom box saying, the hill is alive with the sound of music. Wow. And I had That's G, good, and I had G good Gordon one. Liddy looking at the camera and it went from black to slowly on his face saying, there's a, there's a conspiracy to keep you from hearing good music. <laughs> And that took off, and and then they needed, believe it or not, they needed a host for the morning show for a week or two because they had a lag before they could start. What year were you now? Nineteen. God, I don't even remember. God, because I came out. Yeah, probably. Tell me probably it was ninety. Around, yeah, probably around there. Because that's when I started QVC. There you go. Which is just miles from where you were working. I was in Westchester, Pennsylvania. There, Westchester, Pennsylvania. I know really well. The call, I know the call center. I know exactly where you yeah. were. It's near King of Prussia and all that. Yeah. So I ended up on the radio with Richard Belzer, oh, sure. radio, I, but yeah. I never thought I'd do, I never wanted to do radio, never thought about radio. And if I said to my parents, unlike, I think your parents were supportive, mm. um, my parents were, were <laughs> don't be stupid. <laughs> um, can you go, are you, I don't think you're good looking enough. And I, so I'm on the radio. For radio? You're not Richard good looking Belzer, enough for not radio? Smart, no, that one was not smart oh, enough. Okay. So they could define, they could be specific. So I did that. And then from there, I started doing commercials and other stuff. And then... I was called by a radio station out here to come out and do radio morning drive. I figured I'll come out, I'll take the trip. It's never going to happen. I was going through a divorce. It was a tough time and they wanted me and I held my, you know, uprooted everything, did it. Um, the family came out with me. It was a tough time because they ended up going back and I would go back every week to see my kids. It was horrible, but I, I got to experience that for a year. It was a tough time because the guy who was my boss didn't hire me. Corporate hired me. So, so you're on the air now. I'm on the air now doing okay. morning drive at KLSX in okay. Los Angeles. Yeah, don't gloss over that because I want like when you when you go from writing copy, producing copy, ad sales, and so forth, and now all of I mean, it's a very different dynamic. It's just you and the and microphone. I didn't know, and I didn't know it, and had never done it, and they weren't going to help me because yeah. he didn't like that I was there. Okay. So it was rough. However, I guess I did funny enough stuff or enough stuff that I started meeting everybody wanted to come on from the Richard Lewis. Every comedian came on, um, every actor, every musician I would see. And I knew nobody growing up. I'd never seen a celebrity. You know, I was excited when John Lennon came to just was in Philly. I didn't necessarily see him. Sure. And Graham Nash would come on and I'd say, oh, my God. And he would say, yeah, I drive my kid to school. And listen to you, and I'm thinking, Graham Nash lives near the Gelsons at Haven? Wait, I thought he lived in the mountains with Joni Mitchell. So you start meeting people, and it becomes a thing. It ended, I thought I'm going back to Philly, and KBC called, the talk station, said, we think we'd like you on here. And I said, well, okay. Not knowing again what that was, I just went and do it, did it, and looking back, I don't know how I had the, the balls yeah. to do it. Well, because you didn't know any better. And you're sitting there, and I got to tell you, I don't know if this ever happened to you. So I'm on ABC. And I was doing weekends. Mm-hmm. And I have in the actress, Imogene Coca, <laughs> from younger people know her from vacation. She's the grandmother who they strapped to the roof. Right. Yeah. And George Green, the general manager of the station, who's like the godfather of the station, he runs the whole deal, comes in while I'm sitting with Imogene Coca to read the paper. Because he was there. He came on weekends. It was yeah. like his house. Sure. Okay. 
and this one, they were number one station in America. This was, if you remember, Ken Minier, all these, all these stars yeah, were there. Yeah, Ken Minier, sure. And I'm on, and I'm just starting, and Imogene Coke is there, and I go, God, you worked with Milton Pearl. That must have been, no, not Milton Pearl, with, um, um, oh my God, who's the crazy, the crazy... Sid um, Caesar. Sid Caesar, thank you. Sid Caesar, that must have been insane. No, it was, it was pretty much... <laughs> Yeah, but it was live TV. You must have had stuff happen to you. Well, not, it was, it was really, not. was Sid a crazy man? Very nice to me. And I've asked now 80 <laughs> questions and it's three <laughs> minutes after the hour. And I got an hour. Oh. I'm now sitting in a puddle of Tilden. I mean, it's just <laughs> so bad. And I'm going, I don't know. So now I'm telling stories to her about, you know, I have a grandmother similar to you. And I, that was the worst day of, of radio for me i thought i was that was it i'm dead george is sitting behind the paper i'm getting fired <laughs> and imaging coca basically has figured finished a four-hour interview in eight minutes so i want to kill her and put her on the top of the car we finish she leaves and i know i'm getting fired and george puts down the paper and says who was that again he wasn't paying any attention he was Nothing. reading couldn't care less could care less but so, i learned a valuable lesson be so prepared that if the guest dies doesn't show up whatever don't rely on callers. Don't rely on anything else. Be prepared for the worst every time you <laughs> open open the mic because it's a good chance it could happen again. So, wow. So, this would have been... See, my I listened to a lot of Howard Stern. In those as did days. I. As did I. Early morning, that was... Uh, what was the... In Washington, it was J- W. J- was that no, James? no, in Philly. On oh, Philly, when he moved YSP. To Philly. YSP. Was it YSP? A hundred... I know because I put all my clients on there and I did Howard's campaign... They had no money for the campaign. And Ken Stevens, who ran the station, said, would you do the ad for Howard? And I said, so here's what I need. I just need, will he record something? No. Um, <laughs> will he shoot something? No. How much money do you have? A dollar. So I said, okay, here's what I got. So what listeners saw when they saw the ad I did for no money was they saw a grandmother's type table with a doily, an old-fashioned radio, a Tiffany lamp, and you heard Howard doing something outrageous voice. But on the table was a bowl. A fishbowl mm-hmm. with a fish, ostensibly too, way too large for that bowl. So it's right. like almost bent in half. <laughs> and because a bowl reflects b- bigger, okay, optics, mm-hmm. are, it looked really big. So now Howard's voice is coming out of the radio. This fish is going, you know, the mouth is moving, and you're going, what am I? I don't know what I'm looking at. And it's Howard Stern, not for everybody, <laughs> whatever. And it, and it costs nothing. Peter complained. We got written up. It became this huge thing. Meanwhile, I took the fish. The fish was in there for a minute and a half. You know what I mean? He lived a great longer than you couldn't and get then better. And straight press. down the toilet. It was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> it was so funny. But I had no. I had to work to get something to to to, to show. You, you couldn't so. get better press than an angry Peter, though. Angry that, Peter. And I Peter. And I'm you know I'm an animal lover. As a matter of fact, today when you started this interview, you want to come full circle. Not that I want to end it because I'm enjoying no. it. But I, I did tell Chuck when I came in. I have a dog that's 18. Mm-hmm. And at, right before I got here, we found out, we, we didn't find out, we realized it's time. So mm-hmm. we're scheduling him being put down and I can't, I can't even. Oh. Yeah. So thank you for this because it got me out of that, <sighs> in my head for that. So thank Jeez. you. Wiz, what's the dog's name? De- Dexter. Because when we adopted him, he was Tex. And he was, I didn't want to adopt him, Terrier, because he was too lethargic. It was like a, a giant quaalude. And I thought to my wife, something's wrong here. So we passed, but then something called to me, and we saw him again. And I said, he's unusual. He's really laid back. I hope he's not something wrong with him. We take him to my house. We open the front door, and this dog that was almost paralyzed, he hardly moved. He was like a, like a when you go to see, a, in, in Australia, when you go see what, the, what are they called? The, the, uh, the animals that aren't moving, to, don't move. it's not a panda. Uh, uh, um, yeah, all of us. It's, it's, it's the sloth. Sloth. A sloth. sloth, yeah, yeah, like a sloth. Ah, the three-toed sloth, moved. yes. I open the door, he runs into the living room, jumps on the dining room table, goes downstairs, <laughs> out the door, runs around the pool to the middle of the pool cover, sinks, and I got to dive in. He's been home for a minute, and it never stopped after that. <laughs> wow. He was faking it. He was totally faking it. And I love it. I mean... It's classic terrier. Yeah. See oh, that, there you go. See Are you that little terrier schmuck around? right there? Yeah. That's, I've had three terriers, dude. They just... They're they the have best. attitudes. Nothing but character. Nothing but character. I took him to training so he wouldn't pull him on the leash short. Didn't matter what you do, he would always test you. <laughs> and I look at him going, dude, really? We're going to do this again? And eventually he'd go, all right, give up and go, fine. But next time, I'm pulling again because I can. Isn't that crazy the way we love our dogs, man? It is, it is insane because they're also... 
I don't know about you, but I don't know how many old dogs you've had that you had to put down, but I take him out, and every time I take him out now, I go, dude, how did we get, because it's your life too, how did, yeah. how did I get, how did we get here? How, yeah. how did the time pass so quickly? It's, it, what freaks me out is like, you know, I go away for a week, I was away for seven weeks, you're right? You go away for a month, you're away for seven months. A day is seven days. It's, it's, it's just so, uh, so cruel and yet such a gift. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, they're, man. they're, they're oh, just man. He's, amazing. He, I, I said to my wife, and this, this, this is not, I, you know, I'm not going to go crazy with it. I'm, I'm out of my mind. So thank you. I, you and I didn't mean to no, bring no, this all down, but it was so powerful. It's just, it, I'm looking at him today thinking, dude, wow. We're coming to the end of the road. You know, it's not a, I don't know who came up with the best friend. I mean, man's best friend. I, I wonder who really thought to categorize canines that way, but it was, it was, it was brilliant. You know, I mean, how many comedians, I mean, Seinfeld, right? Have just done un, unlimited What's amounts. The, on the best one was the com- comedian who did again, who did Weekend Update way, way back and, and died last year. Um, Norm, Norm, Norm McDonald. Norm, Norm McDonald. The best. The special Hitler's, Hitler's Dog. Did uh-huh. you ever see that? No, remind me. So the whole special is called Hitler's Dog. But it, you got to just watch the end because at the end is when he actually talks about Hitler's Dog. And he says, you know what? Dogs are, they're unbelievable. They're unconditionally love you. Like Hitler's Dog. Hitler's Dog's home going, oh my God, is he not great? Is he, he's going to be home and we're going to play the ball. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Hitler. You're great, but I mean, you're not, you're no Hitler. He is the, is he not the best? Is he not? Heimlich, what do you say? Yeah, it's Hitler, right? He's the best. Oh my God, the way he scratches. And he just goes on Hitler's dog. Yeah. Hitler's dog doesn't care. He's Hitler. He doesn't know. He doesn't care. He doesn't know. Doesn't care. And even if he knew, I don't care. King, it's Hitler. King Frederick II of Prussia, apparently, is where that comes from in 1786. Wow. Oh, interesting. So Best Frederick friend. of Prussia, and you invoked a Hitler just 200 Here years later. Here we go. Best uh, friend. I, I Coincidence? In, I don't think I so. I don't think anyone's laughing at that job. No, wow. definitely not. Wow. Hey, how long have we been talking? Because I got a million more questions. It's Over probably, an hour. All right. Well, this is, I, but I love, I'm loving this. You, like I said, you gave me a gift, and you really, you because I am a fan, and I have a lot of questions, too. But you really got me out of that headspace. I was really driving here. I said to my wife, I don't know how I'm going to go. How am I getting this in? <laughs> I'm to the office and doing this. I'm Seriously, just- when, when, I, when you pulled into the parking lot and you stepped out of the car, I go, hey, how you doing? I go to give him a hug. He goes, not good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, I was, I was, I was uh, you know, which is funny. We're just doing a show on happiness. And the funny thing is the, the British, the British commander, I think Bill Bailey said, with Americans, they go, how are you? Awesome. I'm awesome. I'm doing great. Oh, my God. I'm awesome. Never better. And he goes, that's insane. In Britain, the best you'll get is, I guess, okay, because the assumption is we thought it was going to be much worse. That's right. <laughs> but it's never good. You're never going to get things are great in Britain, you know? We had to uh, fill... Uh, Keegan? Kogan. 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 Yeah. I know. <laughs> Tell him he spells his name wrong. Uh, Amazing Race? Yeah. yeah. He did a show back in New Zealand called That's Fairly Interesting. Yeah. Oh, my which God. Which I just love. That's fairly interesting. You're right. You know, talk about managing expectations. That's fairly interesting. That's fairly that's interesting. That's an expression in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, it's fairly interesting. Right. That's terrific. That's, Everything. That, that says it. But what, but what you just yeah. did, dude, I mean, honestly, people who are trying to figure out how to put a good face on it almost always botch it up because listeners know you know, from your a career in broadcasting, you if you feel bad that you're going to lose your dog, you should share that with your listeners. Which is why I brought it up here, because everybody, it's universal. Everybody gets it. Everybody Ugh. understands it. And sometimes it helps people or whatever. And again, I was blind. I, I knew it's coming. And Doesn't matter. Uh, what's horrible is my wife today, she had given me this other stuff of when do you know? How do you know? Because I'm trying to be, we got paper down everywhere. Mm. And he's pooping, but we can't go out. One of us has to be home because if he poops and steps in, it tracks it everywhere. Even the it's that, and he lies in his own urine, whatever. And you're denying going, but he's eating and he's doing this stuff, so it's all okay. And she gave me this thing today, written by a veterinarian that was I've seen others that are not good. That this gave the symptoms of of Alzheimer's in a dog and what and and said it's not okay for the dog or you. Or, and I'm reading it and I am crying because I'm going, oh my god, this is real. It's yeah. re- we're there, we're there. And my wife read it and said, we're there. It's not, we got to do this. It's not right. And I, we're, and she is tough and I'm watching her when I'm leaving and I'm going, wow. 
wow, this sucks. I don't want to lose another friend, especially this guy. So, yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Well, look, I mean, I don't know if it's, if it's a comfort, but I don't know of anybody who loved their dog more publicly than Dana Perino loved <laughs> her last dog. Right. Right. And um, when they had to put him down, I, I knew that would be awful. And coincidentally, two days later, I'm sitting across from her being interviewed, you know, and I've always liked Dana. And, and afterwards I said, Hey, I uh, just wanted to say, and I've like everybody else I've heard about your dog. And you know what she said? She said, look, I really miss him and I really love him, but I grew up on a farm. And what my dad told me was real simple. There is no excuse zero excuse mm. to be in the presence of an animal that's in pain you do not have the right to she's bear right. that she's kind right. of witness she's right and she and she said it with a level of certainty that I, honestly i kind of took some weird foreshadowed comfort in it i know this is true we, we all know it's true yes yeah. but you but, gave, you, but when but, you have to finally we're there yeah. uh, with that that pointed out you know what you're there don't 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 drag this out for him. Yeah. Well, and, and don't hold on to it because of you. But woof, duh. You know, it's a, I didn't realize it was going to be, I forgot because our last one, one died in sleep, which was great. Yeah. I mean, he, she went great and it was great. The other one, the other terrier lived again to be like 19 and was by, bit everybody or whatever. And we had to put, put that dog down. But this is, this is horrible. It's just horrible. Yeah. So. Well, look, in, in the history of awkward pivots and i know you've had a lot of i know you spent a lot of time in broadcasting but if we could just the casey case some dead dog uh, well, this is the well, moving up a notch in the countdown <laughs> i don't want to do a dead dog intro again damn me with a dead dog intro so no i i just like to spend the, the last couple of minutes uh on erectile dysfunction you know what i'm so that it's the only way to go out right i i think so it's the only it's way to the go natural out. progression to, from what we were talking about i think we're here and I'm sure I'll make some uh, reference to this in the preamble, which we'll record after you leave so you, you don't cast judgment upon us. But, <laughs> but you, you, with all of, your, all of your considerable copywriting skills, crafted together a couple of spots uh, that, 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 that Chuck read. Uh, we won't mention the name of the he company. He played a character. He played a character. He played a character. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry? Well, yeah, yeah, okay, you'll bleep that out, don't Because you don't want to even get close to identifying. <laughs> okay. This is Peter Tilden saying, I, I, I disavow. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, yeah. Okay, so we don't want to get sued. We don't want to make trouble. But you got to put yourself in my place for a moment, right? This is 15 years ago. Oh, longer. Yeah. Longer, 20 years. I'm yeah, out here. It? Yeah. 25, yeah. maybe. Driving along. Wow. Probably after I, I was know, working on a 20? game show back then and crashing on his sofa. Oh. Yeah, and driving there. Oh, and so suddenly, you were here while that was happening. Oh, sure, sure. As I'm driving to my buddy's house, I'm listening to him talk uh, in, 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 with great passion. Well, you know what's, okay, so what's funny about that, and I'm probably, probably going to zap the comedy out of this for you, but <laughs> what's interesting is when I did... But that's why you're and here. The, and the Joan work ethic and that. So these guys that I knew had the account. And they said, you're really creative and we trust you to, we, we really need your help to, to make this thing work, okay, to get clients. So I said, like an idiot, well, then I got to listen to hundreds of phone calls of people calling in to talk because I got to kind of break the code of what, because everybody jokes about it, everybody thinks they know what it is, yeah. everybody, but I want to hear what it is. I want to hear what motivates people to actually pull the trigger and go to a place or find a medication or whatever. And what I realized after listening to hundreds of these calls was, and I see you do this too as a person. You go deeper. You like you peel the onion a bit to find out. I mean, you're asking me stuff that's find the zit, lance it in slow motion. That's below, right? And so then spend so 10 minutes on I'm it. listening to it and I go, you know what? I got to create a guy because I can't find a guy, and whoever guy doesn't want to talk about it because it's embarrassing. But I got to find a guy who will talk about what they won't talk about. Mm -hmm. So I created a character who would say, "I'm on vacation, <laughs> and I'm I'm going to sleep before my wife because I don't want her to ask me." Mm. to perform because I, I can't do this anymore and it's got a wedge between us and it's bigger than the sex thing it's a relationship sure and it's me and i'm setting myself up for this so we i did all those scenarios and it worked because the people hearing it i wasn't going directly to hey if you want to get a, there's a lot of levels to you know build the wall there's a lot of levels mm -hmm. to all the stuff we talk about so it was intriguing to me to peel that you know, onion back and find out what it what it was and how many how many ways guys would be destroyed 
because yeah. they couldn't do that and how it impacted the relationship and how anger came out of that. And I wouldn't go home. I'm hanging with the guys and I couldn't, I couldn't tell my wife why. I was Dreading Valentine's say, Day. Yeah, yeah. Dreading, Dreading anything right, that, that, yeah. that led to that intimacy. Led to that, yeah. yeah. That, that we're, oh, oh, I'm going to have to perform and I'm going to fail. So this, and you're not sucking the comedy out of it, but it probably sounds like pretty weak tea in 2024 because every second ad <laughs> is either Cialis or Levitra or Viagra. Are they still, I, because, I, and I'm not saying, I, I don't see them as much. Are they still doing You that? can't swing yeah. a dead cat without hitting some. Love the reference. Some certain shape. My dog's pill. dying and he says, you can't swing. Well, he it's didn't all say dead dog. He said dead dog. Or dead schnauzer. Or terrier. A dead schnauzer. They also don't have a tail. It's docked, so you can't swing them. Right. But are they still that? It's still that much. Oh, it's prevalent. I mean, for oh, oh, now it's generic because of course now it's generic because right, now also, everyone is yeah. out there saying, why would you spend twenty bucks a tablet yeah. when you can get it for eight cents? Five, yeah, right yeah. from India and not know if it's crushed elephant hooves, but who cares? Uh, right? Yeah, look, it, it either works or it doesn't, Peter. Yeah, but you, you don't care when you put it, when it has a seven, seven inch hair in the in the tablet on <laughs> Valentine's Day. I don't care. <laughs> you keep pulling the hair out of your mouth. By the way, ate on Willie Willie Nelson's bus. The first bite I took of a Danish had like a fourteen inch hair, and I knew it wasn't mine. <laughs> I kept pulling. You know, you ever see the comedians who oh. pull the magicians who pull the string out of their mouth? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It was me for ten minutes going, "Oh my <laughs> oh, god, what no. did I just swallow?" Yeah, this is the worst. Cherry Danish. I still the can't worst eat cherry, ever. Cannot eat cherry Danish to this day. <laughs> Willie, I think not mine. Oh, I think it. It is Willie. It's got it's got roots in it from 50, 50, 1952. I can see forty eight. I just pulled thirty six out of my oh, mouth. And I pulled in when you were in a highwayman. And I'm I now, think I'm, I think I'm a little high from just uh, just coming into contact with it. And by the way, Jeez. I floss two teeth on the way out. It's yours. It's yours. Oh, it's definitely yours. But yes. it was it's 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 the idea that you that you conjured up the root <laughs> on the end of the hair. Oh, this dude. is the problem. It's not like a hair fell out you know it was rootless it was thing, pulled yeah. so yeah, you have the follicle you have that little so nub on the end of it the, uh, it gives you a little bit you know you the get secret that little, ingredient is yeah, willy wow. is willy <laughs> and it was lustrous oh my god <laughs> so we didn't even talk about evening magazine let's do it right, unless you're in a rush oh, you're I mean, done with me you're done with me no so. it's not look i'll talk to you chuck has to be somewhere uh, chuck has something no, he actually has to be somewhere be somewhere but look they wait what kind of thing do you do well, you wouldn't believe the meeting I had this afternoon. I can't even get into it. Yet. <laughs> give me an area. I, I Animal, can't even... vegetable, mineral. Give me, give me what? <laughs> wow. Uh, no. Don't no, you can't. I can't. Oh, oh I can't. that you can't do. You can I stuff can't. that jeopardizes my I, career, I but can't. You can, I can't tell you where I was. <laughs> no, that's a side. I, I, it's, All right, fine. I haven't even had a chance to process it. And now I have Link to go to a different pitching about... something? Pitching something new? No, I'm okay. pitching anything. I'm, Lawsuit? I, I'm being pitched something. Oh, okay. Isn't that the worst? <laughs> Isn't that the worst? It is just, you know what? The, the, in advertising, this is worth a detour. I'm sorry. But when people call to say, look, we have an idea and we'd like to get on the phone with you. We'd like to just, you know, the Zoom and they got the PowerPoint and the whole thing and the whole thing. And you're just sitting there. It's going to take a half hour. You're hostage. You're in a hostage situation. You're in a hostage situation. <laughs> and you know, three minutes in, this dog this is, don't It hunt. doesn't make any sense. It's, it makes no sense it's for me. It's not proprietary. Somebody can knock right. it off. Uh, it's done cheaply. The slides are bad. I don't want to be, and But they you, won't send it to you. They won't just send it to you in the mail so you can read you it. Because you steal the idea. You don't want to show it to Yeah. Anybody. No, God forbid you should true. show it to somebody. So he's going to tell it to you over a cocktail. Wow. Yeah, because like I can't remember it long enough to well, steal also, it over a drink. Well, but also, if you want to be real honest about that, there's yeah. another level to that. You know what? It's having done advertising forever. Somebody in that room promised and has currency by saying, I've got Mike Rowe. <laughs> Mike Rowe's Mike Rowe going to do that. Yeah, yeah. So they already ha they have oh, a win. They've sold it upstream they have already. Win. Yes, they have. A, their win is that you showed up. So they're, somebody's having Danish with Willie Nelson's hair not in it, <laughs> saying, hey, guys, did I not get Mike Rowe? Not my fault we didn't close it. It was up to you, but I got Mike Rowe. I'm a winner. <laughs> uh, right? Am I right? And you know who in that room, one or two people said, I can get Mike Rowe. I do. So there <laughs> I do. I understand. And then you got to make up a reason. You can't tell them the real reason. Well, it's like... It's like the Just play him this. It's like the farmer in his best overalls with the bouquet of wildflowers shows up knocking on the door, you know, right, just to, you know, to take the girl out. You know, he's got his best, got the hair slicked back, everything. Best shot. Best shot. And 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 she's just she she ain't no, going. No way. You know, and so you have to tell him right there, standing on the porch, 
you just you know with the sun going down and the flowers and the whole thing it's just it's not necessary well it was funny i really came here today because i have a i have a class <laughs> I, I, I just want to run something by you not, quick. yes it's a because we're looking for a a mo- you know the, the what's his name i'll leave the light on for you guy and i thought i got the guy Tom, you're not gonna believe this i think if i get on his podcast he'll be guilty enough i can get him to a meeting and i can be the guy going i got mike rowe for that thing right go. stan richards did that campaign I richards got- group 35 years Tom, ago I'll leave something the light as an on. advertising yeah. guy and loving it it's like radio it's a circus yeah. i don't know how you feel about it. i love i'm passionate about the things i do yeah advertising good advertising for is me is amazing and i that is one of the best ads because jonathan tish who they own the, the tish agency and stuff like that yeah. one day said to me you know what all we're selling he said you know what? when a family goes out i hope he doesn't mind me telling this we put a pitcher of milk and four chocolate chip cookies in the room so when they come back, the kid goes nuts, has milk and cookies. And next time they go to New York, they say, I want to go to that hotel with the milk and cookies because we're all just selling four walls with a bed. Yeah, We're all just selling four walls. So to have that voice saying, I'll leave the light on for you, A, the affect told, made you feel, right away, the voice made you feel good. Number two, it made you feel down home and implied so much stuff without having to right. say it. It was so that, the way it cut through, was so brilliant and it ran forever. It's one of my favorite ads ever. And mine too. It's in my top five. What else is in your top five? Ads? God, yeah. that's a really hard one. God. There's so many. That's what Chuck said 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, ow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know what? It's a hard, it's a hard one to remember because. Let me give you, you one. Know, like, if, like the Super Bowl uh, this year, yeah. Schwarzenegger the, doing the insurance thing and not being able to pronounce it was really funny. Very funny. Because it was an easy premise and they used him well and he played it really, really well. He played it well, but it's not going to last. It's no, going it to come and it's going to go. It was a thing, yeah. Like, like an endu- when I think, I think it's going to be very, very tough to top this Buds for you. I was just going to say, before you said that, I was going to blurt out the Clydesdales. And I'll tell you, because it's, emo- it's, it's emotional right away. Yep. There's history there. It takes you go, God, look what we were, look who we are, look what we can't. It says so much. But it's a reward. As soon as the door opens, like, you see it. We're just saying thanks, man. It's just a beer. Yep. It's for you. Yep. Thank yep. you. Smart. That's great. And um, I think maybe, I mean, for me, the most ingenious was Avis. When Avis came out with, we're we, number two, we, we try harder. harder. We it's have brilliant. to. It's brilliant. Yeah, because they were number 27 when they did it. <laughs> wow. And they became number two about four months later. They never beat Hertz, but they went all the way Jeez, to number so I didn't two. Know th- I didn't know because I never went that deep on that, but I remember as soon as you said Avis, I remember we're number two. We try harder. We have to. You're number 27, dude. You have no shot. What do you mean you try harder? No. Well, now we're number two, so suck it. Well, and I love the old ads. I look at old ads, like Species Spicy Meat, like... Oh, yeah. Yeah, for Tom, you know, That's for all of the meatball. old stuff that were really funny. Uh, the Seltzer. woman who said, where's the meat? Where's the beef? Uh, where, yeah. Lara Barton. Lara Barton. Wendy's, where's right? the beef? Well, again... But the difference was, just like the difference today, there was not 8 million things coming at you. Yeah. You had three networks, and you had an ad campaign where they could spend a fortune and really get share of mind mm. by running it a lot. Today, to get share of mind in, in, in this fragmented culture, it's almost impossible. You got it. Well, everybody's shooting with a shotgun. Yeah. Back then, you had a yeah. rifle. Yeah. Well, what mm-hmm. I used to do with clients in Philly, speaking of Howard, one of my best, who became one of my best friends, was a place that had opened called Worldwide Stereo. And he had not a lot of budget. And I said, so what you do is, we're going to run three. I know everybody's done 22 spots a week and all that. You're going to run three spots a week in Howard, but you're going to run them at the same time. You're going to sponsor this 11 o'clock thing. So at least over 20 weeks, everybody who listens at the 11 o'clock hour, you loan them. Yeah. And then if that works, we'll try the 9 o'clock hour. And it, and it, it worked. People thought he was running more than he would because we weren't all over. And we just kept reinforcing and reinforcing. And his business grew with Howard. Mm-hmm. And Howard made him and a lot of other people because the advertising was so effective. Um, but you got to kind of cut through. I don't know how you do that today. I don't either because, uh, Chuck, you'll appreciate this since we're running long, but I miss well written, long copy. I mean, I miss it. And, and not, I say I miss it like I lived through it. I don't know that I did, but have you seen there's an old, there's an old ad for a car called the Jordan? And it was inspired by a guy on a train riding through Wyoming and coming up next to him at a full gallop is a cowgirl and her cowboy hats behind her head and her blonde hair is snapping in the breeze. 
And she's just riding, keeping up with the train and looking at him. And he sits down and he writes copy for an ad called The Jordan. And it Somewhere is, west of Laramie. That's what it's called. Wow. Yeah. You got it? Read it. Yeah. Uh, I think I have the whole thing. I just have the summary of it. No, oh, that's too bad because this would be a chance to redeem yourself for all that ED stuff you did. Not, not, not no, that you need I, redemption. I'm very proud of the you ED stuff. It was very good. Rather than yeah. the ED stuff, I would look up the whole thing. Can I just tell you? <laughs> can I just tell you though that the the, the ED commercials? I remember that, uh, like you, I heard them on the radio too when I when I was driving, and I heard I heard DJs talking about it. Yeah, they were good, dude. I, I mean, people, honestly, I mean, they they they, they were fun. I mean, creatively, well, they were smart and they and, and they cut through. But you know who I love? Yeah. So forgetting TV ads, and I don't know if you know this, but Bert Bert, the guy from Radio Ranch. Who used to do all oh, yeah. of those ads? Yeah, with a, he like he'd be a kid, but he'd have an adult voice going, "Mommy, I don't know." They were brilliant. <laughs> right. Everything he did was brilliant, and I wanted to be that. Yeah. So I would deconstruct those and understand that you got to get the attention. I don't think David Hall will mind. The one program director that I had that knows stuff said, "You got to do three things when you open your mouth, no matter what you're doing on radio. On this, you got to be you got to be relevant." You got to be entertaining and you got to be informational. If you can do all three, you hit the target. And, I, and it's like, it's true. So even in a, a radio commercial, you can cheat it by casting the right person. Sure. But um, my God, those commercials, the Radio Ranch commercials, were as good as it gets. I laughed at every, didn't matter what it was for. That's interesting. So relevant, entertaining, entertaining, and, and, it, and informative. And, and informative. Yeah. Look, those are the ones that stand the test of time. Those are every show you did. Think of what you know, every show you did. Well, that, that's John Hendricks. That's the guy who founded Discovery saying, look, I have one job. I mean, he had a gajillion, but really I have one job, satisfy curiosity. Bingo. That's what my program will aim to do. Maybe a good ad will do that too, you know? What time is it, Chuck? It's time to go. All right, man. Hey, come back. Let's talk you know, evening I really magazine. Like, I really did. Let's... And thank you for saving me. You really, I, you, just... you think I'm, I can't overstate that enough. I was, well, look, I I'm... just found out right before I came here was when we, when it hit. So thanks. And I was looking forward to meeting you anyway. Cause I'm, uh, I'm going to raise a glass with the people I'm about to join to Dexter. And I mean oh, that because I know, I know how much outsized real Oof. estate those little bastards can occupy. I still you dream about heart. you. Chubby. Still dream about Chubby. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. They because you spent the amount of time, and again, it's like a Beatles song. You remember all the touch points. I, I remember all the stuff. I remember all the stuff I went through bad. I remember all the deaths. I remember going through Jones stuff. I remember going through all this with Dexter. He was there Jesus. for all of us. So, Greatest Beatles song of all time. Boy, that's really hard because I'm I'm such a fan. God Almighty, let me think for a second. Greatest Beatles song of all time. Take your time. We're only coming up on two hours. I don't know. It's come together, jumps out of my mind, but I don't know why. It was a great because one. Because I'm such a Beatles fan, and I got to meet McCartney. I got to meet my two favorite bands and embarrass myself both times. <laughs> Pink Floyd and McCartney. Wow. Yeah. You have time? Two seconds? No. Yeah, yeah, sure. So... My friend Mark Brickman does. Hey man, he's your friend, all right? <laughs> oh, you, oh, this, oh. This, this Where is do you have idea. to be? Where do you have to be? Are you, I don't have to be. I, I could sit here all night. No, no because I can't get it up. It's actually done tonight. I can't so Pink Floyd, my friend, does all of their art, their um, their show. Yeah. And I grew up with Mark. So Mark says, you want to go see them? I, find, I reconnect with Mark out here. He says, you want to see him? My wife says, never seen him. We fly to Mile High Stadium. He says, go to this hotel, I'll meet you downstairs. I didn't know I'm riding the bus with Pink Floyd to the stadium. And my wife's going, why don't you talk to David Gilmore? I said, shut up, shut up, you can talk to David Gilmore. He said, God, you're good. So they're on stage, they're playing. We go to the middle of the stadium and sit down to watch. And if you've ever been to a Pink Floyd concert, the sound is in every, every area is filled with speakers. So you can see it, it's roto sound, it's around you. And in the middle of money, rehearsal of money, they stop. And what I hear out of every speaker is, excuse me, from David Gilmore. We don't like anybody watching our show. And I just kind of turned and I realized my high stadium, which is probably 68,000 seats, there's nobody okay. except us sitting there. Mm. So now he's standing with the band, not playing. And I have to run walk with my wife like, <laughs> we were just leaving. I, I want to kill myself. I wanted to kill myself. It, took, it felt like it took days to get to the, behind the stage. And the minute we got behind the stage, you hear boom, 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 boom. Now I got to ride the bus back with him. I'm thinking, cover my, don't, well, don't let him. It. McCartney, I got to meet McCartney. He's my idol. There's nobody like McCartney. And my wife goes, you must know somebody. He's getting a star capital. I go, Eric Garcetti 
is a counselor. I know Eric. I call Eric. He says, I'm giving him the work. Yeah, come. So I bring my son and I'm mingling with Kenny G and all these people trying to get close. They don't know me, but I'm, I'm talking to them because the guards are looking wait at me. Minute, like, wait, 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 wait. You like, just glo- you're mingling with Kenny G well, well, there are other on artists, your way there are to artists eat there. No, they're sitting there. They're artists that are like in a VIP area and I go up to everyone like, ha, 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 boy, you like Danish, right? I'm just bullshitting so mm-hmm. that the guard doesn't throw me out, even right. though I'm allowed to be there. Right. Now, I'm there. <laughs> And McCartney, sta- I'll show you the photos. I'm in his sunglasses. He's standing in front of me. I'm going to pass out. The thing ends, and I'm following Eric. We go down a carpet. We go up a thing. Next thing, I'm in a little room with a sofa, a TV, and a little bar, and we're standing there. McCartney comes in with his wife and his son, and they're over there, not that far from me. And I go, wow, this room's going to fill up soon. No, it's not. <laughs> you walked into his private dressing room. <laughs> Oh, so now nice. the armpit, I'm sitting until the sweat again and going, mm-hmm. I'm now, my face is going to be in every backstage flyer saying, do not let him in, do not let him in. And I'm trying, I'm going to make the move. What am I going to say? What am I going to do? I'm dead. I'm dead. Oh my God. Oh my God. And somebody thankfully says, Paul, we're ready for you. And I guess photos or whatever. And he looks at me on the way and goes, hey, mate, hey, mate we can speak later. Because figuring I must be somebody. Must be somebody. Yeah. I'm now soaking. I'm like soaking, soaking wet. A puddle of Tilden sweat, was it? puddle of Tilden sweat. So there to my two, uh, my two idols. Not God. loud near either. So. Have you been to the Sphere yet? I have not. Have you? I have. And? Amazing. Amazing. Is it distracting or is it overpowering? Does it help the music? Hurt the music? Oh, it, oh, it, it helps, helps everything. Music. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, makes it, it makes it more of an... You saw you too? It, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, look, look, you look like it's a religious experience. Like it's that big. Well, I'll tell you, more than anything was the realization that you know you work hard your whole career. You go to concerts. The idea is get as close as you can. The closer you get, the more of a connection you have. Right, and good for you. I I was sitting up in like the high three hundreds. He was in the four hundreds. Yeah, I guess. and I was like, this is great. So <laughs> it's it's, it's backwards. So Peter. what's yeah. interesting is Mark Brickman, that guy who's brilliant at those Pink Floyd show built the um the la um philharmonic dome mm-hmm. and, and took it on tour and he said my whole goal because mark is a genius when it comes to lighting of the empire state building and he's won awards for his stuff he said i wanted it to get dark enough that i could make the audience move that i could feel like they were going into it but it never got dark enough that's the sphere right they can do that's stuff it. like oh. mo- movement think yeah you think the whole thing is splitting over your head you see helicopters yeah. coming into it these are thousands, hundreds of thousands of pixels in God knows how many screens all seamlessly integrated with a bunch of AI that our brains are simply too and old. It's to... so clear. It's oh, the visuals are this stunning. This is the thing that got me. You're like looking at Bono and he's like a tiny speck on right, this little right, square right. down down there. Right. But he's up here as well. And you can. As close and, as you and I yeah, are. Yeah. Right and he's he's the size of a building right on on the, the side <sighs> of the wall. And it's all in sync. I don't know how, you know, you, you, know, you, you hear somebody did for me, you did, so Jason and, and I celebrate birthdays. So he said, your birthday's coming up soon. Oh, yeah. Where do you want to go? And he, we were trying to figure out somewhere weird and funny, whatever. I think that's it. I think I got to go see that. I can't so, imagine Jason Alexander being, and I'm just going to blow the sunshine. I can't imagine him being a more entertaining guest than you were in the last, uh, oh, man. how long is it, Chuck? Was it four hours now? Uh, it's uh, four and a half. Yeah, just about. Honestly, yeah. the time it flew by. It feels like five, five <laughs> yeah. and a half, six like hours. Ten. Yeah. No, really, thank Underwood. you sincerely no, my, for coming you, by. This is, I, I said I was no, flattered I mean, when I started. I really mean it. Well, it, it, I appreciate it if I can return the favor. I, we no, you want really. Pocket. Jason's a huge fan. Really, no, really. <laughs> yeah, Mike can't, really, no, really. Mike's not coming <laughs> in. Really, no, really, no. no. Van Eyes, you do no. Van Eyes? Yeah, really, no, really. He's not, he's not coming in. Yeah, Jason said. It's the sequel. Not really. Jason is very particular about who comes on, and he, you were one of the first names he mentioned, but you notice we didn't call you for a year. So, mm. well, look, I'm standing by. I get down here once a month, and I got I'd, it. We'll I'd, do it. We'll yeah. do it. I'd be honest. Chuck, we'll thank you for reconnecting. Oh, it's, it's, great it's so Chuck, great. Chuck, by the way, Good Chuck time. was so much fun to work with too, and so talented, and pulled that off uh, playing thank characters. You. So that was pretty. Those cool. those were the days prior <laughs> to the bitter, broken Klaus Meyer right, we just, have today. Just, yeah. just say goodbye. Yeah. See you next week, folks. That was Peter Tilden. Oh, uh, the podcast is called Really No Really. Yes, it is available everywhere, whether you want it or not. Well, there it is. Yeah. How do you say no to that? Fascinating stories. Adios, my friend. If you like what you heard, and even if you don't, oh, won't you please, won't you please, pretty please, pretty please, please, subscribe. Well, I hate to beg and I hate to plead, but please, pretty freaking please, please.